The latest quarterly economic report from the Central Bank of Nigeria revealed that Nigerians repaid a staggering 4.05 trillion naira in personal loans during the second quarter of this year. Now, this repayment reduced personal loan balances from 7.52 trillion naira in the first quarter to 3.47 trillion naira in the second quarter, marking a 53.9% decrease. Now, this significant decline in personal loan balances coincides with the CBN's monetary policy adjustments aimed at curbing inflation and controlling the money supply. Now, in the first six months of the year, Nigerians took out approximately 5.49 trillion naira in personal loans from banks and other financial institutions. Now, principal partner Woodridge and Scott consultant Shegun Shokuto joins me now for more on this conversation. Thanks for joining me, Shegun. Thanks for having me, Justin. Good morning. Uh, good morning to you. Yeah, thanks for joining us on the show. Let's just even start from what most Nigerians are talking about, which is food. Everybody wants to eat and everybody wants to have food in their stomach. But then uh, the report from, uh, from the NBA is saying that uh, imported rice price jumps by 1. 114%. I don't know how many Nigerians still buy um, imported rice. You know, what we tell even the Nigerian um, produced one are uh, very, very expensive. But, but let's look at that vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the food inflation in the country. You know, for you to have jumped by that particular amount in um, year and year, what does that really tell us? Because over time, the, 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 the federal government had talked about, uh, you know, concessions for farmers and of course for these grains, but yet Nigerians are not even seeing the impact of um, all of these measures. Well, I, I think <clears throat> what, what this basic fairly says is that whatever the government is doing needs to be re-examined. It's oh. not working. The, the, the objective of government at the end of the day, all governments anywhere in the world, um, is to provide stability so that businesses can thrive and people can go about their normal, lawful oh. Um, lives and, and, and be whatever that um, they have the capacity to become. Uh, so when when you implement policies as a government, that has to be at the back of your mind, you know, trying to ensure that people can plan. Um, uh, a situation where you, you have a staple as rice increasing by over 100 and over, well over 100 percent in just one year means that we have to rethink whatever we're doing. Um, it also means that the various policy initiatives that the government has rolled out over the last six months or thereabouts to try and address, uh, you know, this rising food inflation, especially the price of some of these important food items like oh. rice, has not worked. Um, either has not worked or in some cases have not been implemented to the letter. And we expressed these fears. You know, it's one thing to come out with a policy pronouncement oh. um, and people celebrate it and say, oh, this will make an impact. Uh, for example, saying that there's going to be a duty waiver, uh, oh, a duty waiver, duty waiver. Oh. you know, it's not a bad idea, oh. but it has to be implemented because if that had been done, uh, tariffs on rice alone, the, the, the last time I checked, was well over 50%, uh -huh. right? So that would immediately have affected the price of imported rice. But if the price of rice is not coming now, it means that that policy has not been implemented to the letter. So government really needs to look at its policy um, making and this policy implementation process to ensure that citizens can feel the impact of this policy. Okay, in as much as the federal government said in July that uh, the, the, they were introducing a 150-day uh, window uh, period for duty-free import, they mentioned rice, they mentioned uh, wheat, cowpeas, and uh, brown rice, and uh, some of that. But, okay, even if they are not implementing, what can they do to actually support uh, maybe local uh, production of these uh, grain? Because I'm sure we have arable land that should be able to help us uh, get this stuff and be a bit um, self um, sustenant absolutely and, and you know this this has been the concern for quite a number of you know watchers of these issues over the last year and four or five months that this administration has uh, had been, has been in place um you could have argued a year ago four months into the administration yeah. now oh, it's too early to say you know but that argument falls flat on his face today because this is now almost a year and a half after True. this administration has come on board you can no longer say it's too early um, so what are the things that we could have done differently? I'm not even going to go into the subsidiary removal, um, um, floating of the Naira conversation. The impact and the effect of that, we can all see and we can all feel it, right? So let's even leave that at the side. But having done that and having seen the outcome of these things as quickly as those results, um, those outcomes happen to us, what has the response of government been? 
like you said, do mm -hmm. we are we supposed to be trying to make imported rice cheaper, or are we supposed to be ensuring that we do not need to import rice at all? Mm -hmm. And if we had pursued that policy um, with energy and vigor one year ago, by now, trust me, we would have at least witnessed one harvest season, and maybe prices of rice may have come down. What could the government have done? Mm. Provide um, funding to farmers, yes. you know, rice farmers in particular. Mm. Provide um, access to the inputs for production, fertilizer and any other inputs that they may need. Help them with mechanization of their production so that you can ramp up productivity. Um, talk about the, the, the quality of the seeds, you know, uh, uh, ramp, uh, uh, tapping into the power of research and mm. science to ensure you can improve yields significantly, and more crucially, um, approach the security concerns around farming, farming across the country uh, from a, an emergency perspective. Uh, put together uh, measures and policies that will protect farmers, mm. you know, in, in very clear, specific, tangible ways beyond you know, the optics and the sound bites of uh, giving marching orders to military high command and all of that. Mm. Uh, I think we haven't seen enough of these types of actions from governments that would have resulted by now, mm -hmm. a year later, in appreciable impact in terms of the reduction in the cost of food. And you know, it's not only rice. Mm -hmm. This this affects also beans. Beans yes. has now become a luxury food that people True. cannot afford. And it's all about the same, mm -hmm. you know, around the same issues. Yeah, because if you look at it, at the end of the day, right now, most Nigerians are even patronizing these locally produced ones because uh, the, the imported ones are really very expensive. From what from, from, from uh, research that we made, it's over like 120, 125 in a per bag. And that's against uh, the locally, ones, uh, locally produced ones that are sold for about um, 80, 85,000 now. So but let's just move on and, and move to other issues right now. For the past uh, few days, uh, the... Petroleum marketers, uh, the uh, Petroan, the Ipman, and of course Dangote, they have been in the news over talk of um, monopoly allegation, a uh, price of uh, petrol, how uh, they feel that uh, uh, Dangote's uh, uh, PMS is actually expensive. And Dangote uh, came out the other day and said that if any marketer claims to be buying salt at the lower price in as against what they are selling, then they are getting salt standards. So it's been a major back and forth uh, here and there. So what are your thoughts really, Shogun? Um, and um, that man has come out <laughs> mm -hmm. with a counter po uh, position and a counter statement uh -huh. to say, hey, Dangote is, is being economical with the truth, uh -huh. and they have been resolute in their stance that they are responsible members of society. They will not set out for, the, for, for, for economic gain and profit to uh -huh. harm Nigerians by bringing substandard goods into the country. Uh -huh. Right? And they uh -huh. also said something that I found quite instructive that if Dangote, that Dangote must understand that he is in competition uh -huh. with imported products, you know, so uh -huh. there are no other refineries that has the capacity that he does. So he's not competing with anybody in local really. But he's competing with imported with other refineries across the world. And rather than quite dirty by casting as questions on the various stakeholders down the value chain, they are suggesting to him that he should rule them. You know, and they are asking him to be more transparent with this price mechanism. You know, he, he, the price that Dangote came out with recently, he mm. came out with that because of this controversy that arose from you know, statements made by, by the petroleum marketers and all of that. So I think that much as I feel that Dangote has to be supported because local production is absolutely critical to our economic development, it has a significant impact on the exchange rate, but Dangote must understand that this is not a fight that he can win by fighting dirty. He's got to win this by being a responsible competitor, recognize that he has, there are actually alternatives. He, you know, he's, he's not a monopoly. He might think that because he is the only refinery in Nigeria today with the capacity that he has, that he, he has uh, the, the advantage of being a monopoly. But that's not true. Yeah. He's not a monopoly because the LNPC or the regulatory body, whichever one of them it, it is, is still allowing people to import yeah. um, refined products. And he's competing against those imported refined products. So he does have to woo his um, customers over, woo Nigerians over, be more transparent, provide some benefits to Nigerians, even if that means he will do so at some short-term 
uh, cost, you know, mm -hmm. maybe in terms of uh, giving up some percentage of its profits and what have you. So I, I think we need to see a bit more from Dakota Refineries as an organization uh, to compete more responsibly. Okay, I know every business is actually out to make profit. You even said that maybe just uh, maybe to hold profit down for a short term so that um, they can actually enjoy, you know, uh, large scale, uh, you know, supply and everything. But, you know, if I may look at it critically, because before now, Nigerians um, have felt that um, it will be Uhuru when uh, Dangote come on stream that um, the price of um, PMS and diesel will actually drop considerably. But the reverse seems to be the case because over time, in the past um, one month or so, you know, the NMPC has increased um, its price more than twice. So, is it that um, the Dangote uh, refineries, uh, they are not getting enough, uh, you know, uh, will I say, sort of support, you know, from the government, you know, in order for them to maybe really get into this core production and, and, and somehow reduce uh, the price of PMS, or what exactly are the issues? Because before now, there were lots of back and forth over before the, uh, the, the PMS was actually even being uh, supplied for the first time. You know, um, we had said it repeatedly at that time. <laughs> that I had said it on your platform and other yeah. platforms that I had the opportunity to speak on, that anybody expecting the price of PMS or diesel or any other refined product to come down because we're now refining locally yeah. um, is living in a lot of land. You know, it's, 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 it's a mirage. It's, it was never going to happen because, you know, um, this is a private refinery that is um, um, operating to, to make profits one. Yeah. Number two, and more critically, is that the government had made it clear long before operations of Dangote started, in fact, long before this administration came on board, that crude oil was going to be supplied to Dangote at international prices. Mm. That, that is a fundamental, critical factor that determines the local, at uh, the pump price of PMS. If Dangote is getting crude oil from the government at $80 per barrel or $81 per barrel, whatever the price is today, regardless of whether it's paying naira or not because even if it's paying naira mm. that 80 dollars will be converted at the prevailing market rate the exchange yeah. rate true so there is absolutely zero advantage in terms of pricing beyond you know the savings on freight that it will cost to bring you know those products from abroad into nigeria that's the only saving it's not significant enough so for us to get a price reduction because Dangote is producing the government will have to provide crude to Dangote at preferential prices well below international rates, which yeah. is still some form of subsidy. So the subsidy question will not go away. If we want lower pump prices, yeah. the government must one way or the other, Subsidies. either by paying subsidies directly yeah. or by giving up some profits you yeah. know, on its on his crude oil production, yeah. they must still subsidize PMS for Nigerians. Otherwise, the bad news is that this is not the end. It's okay. still going to go higher. That's the bad news. We're at 1,039 from, from yeah. uh, NNPC in Lagos today. Yeah. Expect that to hit 1,200, 1,300 as the price of crude oil continues to go up and as Naira most likely continues to lose value as yeah. a result of the failure of the government to continue to defend the Naira. So the pump price of PMS is still going to go up. Wow. My dear Nigerians, let's not deceive ourselves. Nobody should expect the price to come down because Dangote is producing local. Well, not a relief at all for, for most Nigerians. That's, that's some sad news. But let's uh, get to the final conversation for today. And uh, Nigerians repaid 4.05 trillion naira personal loans in the second quarter alone. You know, that's attributed to the Central Bank of Nigeria. It, it just uh, leads me to think that um, Nigerians are actually practically living on debts or loans, you know, to even meet personal consumption. What does that really tell us as a country if households need to borrow to feed? Well, uh, to, to be honest with you, um, the most productive economies, the economies that we admire, that we like to run to the United States, the UK, you know, and other Western economies and societies, they, they run on debt. You know, they run on consumer credit. Um, and consumer credit drives consumption, which will then drive production, which will drive investment and increase you know, GDP. All of those would also affect government spending. And at the end of the day, you have GDP growth. Um, so it, it, it's it's never going to be different from in Nigeria. In fact, I, I think that we need to, that's why I commend the credit for, um, um, you know, initiated by this administration that is deliberately trying 
to increase loans and consumer credit to made available to Nigerians. Um, the advent of uh, credit rules is also a very good thing because that then means that repayment can happen because Nigerians has know that if you don't repay, then you can't borrow again. Mm. I think the, the instructive part of all of this for me is that um, in Q2, uh, Nigerians paid back um, about 4.7 trillion or mm. 3.7 or something like that trillion naira in, in personal loans. And what the reason for that is largely the cost. It's the fact that as the CBN has continued to increase um, the NP, NPR, uh, mm. the cost of borrowing has gone up and people are now beginning to look at it and prioritize and say, look, I'm better off not borrowing this money. And they pay down. And mm. that's bad news for the economy. I think it's important that people should be able to borrow to finance, you know, consumption. Because if you don't borrow and you don't consume, mm. uh, if you don't consume, then, you know, um, uh, GDP growth will, will, be, will be curtailed. Uh, so the CBN needs to look at this as um, uh, a direct result of their continued hawkish stand in mm. trying to control inflation, you are curtailing consumption and you are curtailing growth. So they've got to look for a different strategy to try mm. to bring inflation under control. This continued increase in NPR is not working. I've consistently said this for over six, seven months. You have mm. to stop hiking rates and begin to look to the fiscal side um, and maybe other liquidity controlling measures that you can adopt beyond increasing rates. As it stands now, it just isn't working. And that's what okay. this report about that's paying back their debt is basically telling us. Uh, thank you so much. I'm sure you couldn't have said it um, better. That's as much as we can take. We do appreciate your time on the show. Thanks for having me. All right, I've been speaking with principal partner Woodridge and Scott Consulting, Shago Shokbito, as we looked at um, some of these issues, uh, uh, developing issues in the economy. You know, Nigerians are repaying their loans, and of course, a uh, bag of rice, still being expensive, the imported ones that is, and of course, uh, the uh, the drama between the petrol and um, Ipman and Dapman on the petroleum price. That's the size of the show for today. My name is Justin Akadoni. Many thanks for being there. <laughs>